purpose now it never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. I can go directly to the Lord in prayer. He has told me I may boldly enter there. And, and he, he listens as his promises I plead. I find mercy there and grace for every need. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. And the hope of heaven's glory serves me so. Where I'll live with Christ forevermore, I know. That is why the things of earth I loosely hold. I've eternal riches better far than gold. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God's child. Oh, it is wonderful to have your sins forgiven. Oh, it is wonderful to be redeemed, justified, forever reconciled. Oh, it is wonderful. To be redeemed, be redeemed justified, justified forever, forever reconciled. Amen. Take your Bible this morning, if you would please, and go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 for our scripture reading. 1 Timothy chapter 6, please. We're going to read the first eight verses. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll read verse 1, then you join me on 2, then I'll read 3, and we'll together on 4, we'll alternate like that, and that way we'll end together on verse 8 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. And as we usually do, let's stand together to read the Bible, all of us standing to read the scriptures, and I'll begin on verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing pleased to the reading of our scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful opportunity to have copies of the Word of God in our hand this morning. And I pray that each of us would be ready to receive your Word today, not as the words of men or the words of a man, but as it is in truth, the words of God. We believe the Bible to be alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I believe it has the power to change people's lives. And Lord, we trust it will do so this morning and that each of us who hear the word will mix it with faith 
so it will be profitable unto us. Bless the special now as it's given. Tune our hearts to your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Lost in the darkness, I stumbled alone. Far from the sunlight of day. Then Jesus found me and made me his own. He drove my darkness away. Before I loved him, he loved me. Before I found him, he found me. shadows I wandered in sin far from the warmth of the light then Jesus found me and changed me within kindled his love in the night before I loved him he loved me before I found him, he found me. Before I sought him, he sought for me. Yes, Jesus cares for me. Now in the sunlight I follow his word through every trial and test. He is my Savior and He is my Lord. Gladly I'll give Him my best. Before I loved Him, He loved me. Before I found Him, He found me. sought for me. Yes, Jesus cares for me. Amen. <clears throat> now, Father, we bow in prayer this morning as we come to open up your word together. I want to thank you again for allowing us this time to open up your word and Thank you for a country where we're still free to do this. And Lord, I'm praying that you'll help each one in the room to give their careful attention now to the truth we have before us today. Lord, help me as I bring the message and help me to be clear and help it to be easy to be understood. And Holy Spirit, do what only you can do uh, in each one of our hearts and lives. Help me as I bring this message and Help each individual as they listen. May your will be done in the next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, there's a pair of spiritual traits that are given to us. Godliness and contentment. Now, if you have godliness, but you don't have contentment, you only have half of what God says we ought to have. If you have contentment, but you don't have godliness, the truth is, I don't think you'll ever have contentment if you don't have godliness. I believe godliness is the foundation of contentment. Let me give you an illustration. I was reading as I was preparing for the message I was reading the testimony of a pastor who, he said this, he, he said, I grew up in the home of a word of faith pastor. Um, how many of you know when we talk about the word of faith, 
type ministry. Anybody know what that means? If I said it's the prosperity gospel, how many know what that means? It's a name it and claim it type uh, ministry. In other words, uh, if you're a Christian and you trust God and there's no unconfessed sin in your life, then you're going to be healthy and wealthy and you just won't have any problems. You're just going to be happy all the time because God will just keep blessing you and blessing you and blessing you. And you won't ever have any problems. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to have money. He wants you to have the best things in the world. Um, the evangelist not long ago that was asking his followers, saying he needed a new $53 million airplane. That would be the word of faith, man. Uh, he believes that he deserves the best. And that not that, not that he should get it, but that you should give it to him. And, uh, but that's, that's how that operates. Well, this guy, this man grew up in that kind of a home. And when he went to Mississippi State University, uh, he said he became the president of the campus ministry that's committed to that kind of theology. But while he was in college, his younger sister, who he loved deeply, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And he and his father, who was also a word of faith pastor, took their daughter around to different crusades of the word of faith preachers. Can I help you out this morning? We, we won't get mad at me. Took her around to Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Marilyn Hickey, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan. Most of the people you see on television are of this word of faith theology. And guess what? No one could heal her. Finally, at 23 years of age, she died. And when she died, all of his confidence, his testimony, he said all of his confidence in that kind of teaching came crashing down around his ears. He said, I couldn't believe it anymore. And, and the reason I relate that to you is that their confidence, what they're basing their theology on, was misplaced. It was a a false confidence in something that didn't exist. In other words, you if if they, they think if you have trials in your life or if you have problems in your life, then only one of three things is possible. Number one, you're not a Christian. Because if you were a Christian, you wouldn't have any problems. Secondly, if you're a Christian and you don't have enough faith, see if you had enough faith, you wouldn't be sick. And most of them, and, 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 and you know, if, if you go and they don't heal you, then it's your fault you didn't have enough faith. Or there's unconfessed sin in your life. That's why you're having problems. If you would just confess the sin and get right with God, then all the blessings would begin to flow again. And what, what this man testified was, he says, I, could, I knew my sister was a believer. I knew her love for Jesus Christ. So the fact to say that she wasn't saved, that's impossible. I wouldn't believe that. To say that she didn't have enough faith, he said that couldn't be the case. He said she was so open about her relationship with God and she was so open to talk about uh, Jesus Christ with others. He said, I don't conceive of any unconfessed sin in her life. So he, it failed the test of the right placement of confidence in his life. So we realize that that theology isn't biblical. It's not based on the Bible. It's not, not true. It's, it's, it's got a false premise or a false foundation. Because we know this. We have struggles. We have problems. We have trials. But if we're not careful, wait a minute we too can place our confidence in the wrong thing. We can make sure that when, for instance, you're starting out when you're first married and you know you're struggling. You're, 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 you're trying to, to, to make enough money last for the month. And, and you know what you think? You think, man, just if I just had $250 more a month, man, that... That's what we need. But if we just had $250 more a month, then everything would be okay. 
And we're placing our confidence in just having a little bit more money. But you find as you get older, it's not 250 more, it's 500 more or 750 more or whatever it might be. It just continues to go up. But if that's the case, we're locating our contentment in the wrong place. But it can be not just money. It can be relationships. Well, if I just had her or I just had him, then, then my life would be so much better. If I just could have this status or if I could just have this success, if I could just get this position, if I could just get this promotion. We understand what Paul's saying. If you read the first part of chapter 6, he's talking about exactly these things. Notice what he says in verse number 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine of which is according to prosperity. You're not listening, are you? You're not reading along, are you? If your Bible says prosperity, you got the wrong Bible. No, it says that to the doctrine which is according to what church? Godliness. If he's not teaching that, notice what he says. <clears throat> he's proud, knowing nothing, doting about questions and strifes of words, where have come of envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. Notice this line, supposing that gain is godliness. That's the prosperity gospel. But what does God tell us to do? From such withdraw thyself. You don't have anything to do with them. Don't need to listen to them. Don't need to tune them in. In fact, God says tune them out. Because it's false doctrine. And a little leaven can leaven the whole lump. Be careful. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now let me, let's define godliness. Can we do that this morning? Godliness in, simplest, in its simplest form is God-likeness. God-likeness. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, God desires that He develop in us His attributes so that we would remind people of Him. Okay? Okay? So we remind people of God. That's godliness or God-likeness. Now, who was the visible manifestation of God on the earth? Jesus Christ was. He was the visible manifestation of God on the earth. So if I so that's a that's the pattern for us then because he walked here on earth. That was God in the flesh. So that's why Jesus said, I've walked this so you can you can follow my steps you can follow my example and so we're to be like christ romans 8 and verse 29 it says that we are to be conformed to the image of his son of god's son we're to be conformed to the image of jesus christ that is the will of god for every christian that you and i be like christ that, that's why i don't i don't agree that people say well i'm saved that's all that matters. That's not true. It is important that you're saved. It's important that you know Christ is your Savior. But my friend, that isn't the end. That's the beginning. See, that's the start. It's like, it's like getting in a, in, a, in a race. You're gonna, How many of you ever run in a 5K race? Anybody run in a 5K race? Oh, God bless your heart. Okay. And, um, you know, it's like, okay, you enlist. You're going to get in the race and you're on it, and everybody gets at the starting line, and they shoot the gun off to go, and you just start walking the other way. 
Everybody says, man, what are you doing? Hey, I, I was in the race. That's all that mattered. I don't need to run it, do I? Yeah, you need to run. You don't just enter to enter. You enter to run. And you don't get saved to say, okay, I'm saved. Now that's all that matters. No, no, no. God says you're saved. Now I'm going to work in you and I'm going to work through you and I'm going to reproduce my Son in you. I want Christ to be formed in you. To be like Christ. Jesus' likeness is the same as godliness. Jesus' likeness is the same as godliness. In other words, we're to be like Christ in our attitudes. We're to be like Christ in our philosophy of life. We're to be like Christ in our words that we say. We're to be like Christ in our behavior. Now, Christ's likeness, our godliness, has an opposite. It is worldliness. The opposite of God in the Bible is the world. James tells us, if you want to be the friend of God, you'll have to be the enemy of the world. And if you're going to be the friend of the world, you'll be the enemy of God. So, there's, there's no middle ground there. And really, there's not a middle ground between godliness and worldliness. You can't be part of each. You, if you're not godly, you're worldly. There's only two views and two ways to go at it. It's like, it's like you're either saved or you're lost. Right? Nobody, somebody, are you saved? Somebody says, well, sort of. What's that mean? Then nobody's sort of saved. And you're either saved or you're not saved. You've either accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're trusting Him alone for your salvation and you're trusting Him and what He's done for you to take you to heaven one day, or you haven't done that. You're either in or you're out. You're either on or you're off. You're either up or you're down. There's no, there's no in between. And a lot of times we like to think, well, I'm, I'm not real godly, but I'm not worldly either. I just kind of like to stay in the middle. No. And, and if you try that, God says you're lukewarm. And He doesn't have very nice things to say about lukewarm Christians. So the Bible says in Romans 12 and verse 2 that we're not to be conformed to this world, worldliness, but we're to be transformed, godliness, by the renewing of our mind. So we'll prove by the way we live what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. So when we talk about worldliness, it's, it's talking about the attitude, the philosophies, the words, the viewpoint of the world. Okay? That's what he talked about when it Bible talks about love not the world or the things that are in the world. It's not talking about don't love automobiles or don't love flowers or trees or sunshine. Those are all things that are in the world. I'm not talking about that. The, the, he's talking about loving the attitudes and the philosophies and the words and the ways of the world, the world system. So godliness is godlikeness or Christ-likeness. What we are endeavoring to do, what every believer is, our goal is to be like Christ. Every day, y'all say, I, I want to be more like Christ today than I was yesterday. And allow God to work that in your life and in my life. The world thinks that the world's view is looking over at the godly person thinking, what a dull life you live. Man, you don't have any fun. Man, you ought to be over here and live it up. You're, you're pretty dull. This is exciting. This is great. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But listen, uh, there's no life as exciting as a life that's yielded to God. A life that's lived by faith and not by sight. Faith where you don't see what's coming. You don't know what's coming. It's all up to God. 
That's pretty exciting. You don't know what's next. You don't know what God has in mind next for you. That's the way to live. I'll give you several statements here from 1 Timothy. Look at chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, would you please? Verse number 7, Paul tells Timothy, his, and he's training Timothy for the ministry, and he tells Timothy, refuse, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto what church? Godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto, what's the next two words? All things. How many things? Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. First thing I want to point out to you here is that godliness is to penetrate every area of our life. Godliness is to penetrate every area of our life. Now, he mentions physical exercise here. He doesn't say that bodily exercise profits nothing. There is profit in bodily exercise. It profits a little. We know that there are physical advantages to exercising and to benefits to sports. There's many benefits to that. Health experts will tell you that. But when it says it profits a little, it it's, it's, not just, it's not just saying it's for, it doesn't do much good. The, the little there refers more to the time that it profits you. What is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. That's what he's talking about bodily exercise. It's for a little time. What, what is the bodily exercise going to benefit, benefit us? It will benefit us for this little time that we're on this earth. Hey, go to the gym every day, work out, eat healthy, eat fruits and vegetables, you know, take vitamins, die anyway. Okay? You're, you're going to die. Now, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy life probably more if you're healthy and you exercise and you take care of yourself. That's a good thing. But you understand, it's just for a little while. It's not, for, it's not going to affect your eternity. God isn't going to have a section of heaven for those who went to the gym and a section of those who didn't. Aren't you glad about that, huh? Not going to be that way. It's just for a limited duration. And yet, people spend all kinds of money on bodily exercise. Didn't. There was a day when, when our country was more agricultural and manufacturing and people didn't need to go to a gym. They worked. <laughs> that was their physical exercise. So we got away from that. There's these things pop up called fitness centers or gyms. I'm kind of like the fellow who said, I, I don't call my bathroom the John anymore. I call it the gym. So I tell people when I get up in the morning, I go to the gym every day. <laughs> people spend money on belonging to a gym membership or a fitness club. According to A.C. Nielsen, the top uh, popular sport in the U.S. for par people participating in and work out is swimming. According to their survey, 103 million people supposedly regularly swim. Others are bicycling and, well, I can't believe this on here, fishing. <laughs> what kind of exercise is that, Brother Yoder? Is it good exercise, is it? Yeah. Get that arm moving a little bit, huh? Wow. Bowling. 
13 million people tried, according to their survey, 13 million people tried water skiing at least once in the last year. And they spent $100 million in the process. There's some profit in bodily exercise. But notice what the verse says. Body exercise profit little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Godliness profitable for your relationship with God? Sure. Is godliness profitable for your relationship with your husband? Your wife? Your children? Your co-workers? Your other church members? Profitable for all things. In all things. Godliness is profitable for business. Godliness is profitable for your job. Godliness is profitable for your relationships. Godliness is profitable for a nation. It's profitable at church. It's profitable at work. It's profitable in your time off. You won't find an area of life where godliness is not profitable. Because God says it's profitable in all things. You never have a time where you you lay down the godliness. Godliness is profitable unto all things. So it's to affect every area of our life. But let me give you a second point. Godliness promises life at its best. Godliness promises life at its best. Look at verse number 8. Having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. I'm here to tell you today, life at its best is when you live godly. Life at its best is when you live to please the Lord. That's life at its best. Hey, that's where the gusto is. Not drinking the alcohol. Say, oh, live it up and party it up and go ahead. And I I was telling somebody today, a brother, uh, Linderman, and I was telling him, I just heard on the radio this week, they've opened the first beer hotel. Did you hear about it? Every room has their own tap in it. Drink all you want. Not only in the room... In the shower. And if you want to get a reservation there, you better go ahead and get your name on the list. There's already hundreds that are signed up waiting to get in there. They're, they're, they're booked up solid for a while. I'm not saying they won't have fun. But there's a sorrow coming. Ain't going to last. Godliness, not only for the life that now is, oh, but the life that is yet to come. Hey, I, somebody says, well, you know, hey, if, if there was no heaven, I still would want to live a Christian life on earth. Because it's great living for God. It's great living the Christian life. I know as you get older, sometimes you look back. John here was sharing with me during handshaking time that he joined the army in 1951. A couple years ago. And how quickly that time goes by. Sometimes you look back and you reflect, you know, as driving into church this morning and it was a little after six o'clock and and somehow my mind went back to when I was in college just just 21 22 years of age we had I would drive over to the gym because we had basketball practice at 5 30 in the morning before classes and I always had the radio on brother Yoder and it was Harold Seitler it was the bright spot hour 
Turn the radio on and it would be some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all won. He'll, he'll claim the victory, break through the blue. Some golden daybreak for me, for you. Good morning, radio friends. This is Harold Seitler. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I relive that as I'm driving down the freeway. And, and all of a sudden, I'm not a 60-year-old man. I'm that 22-year-old kid again. And, and I got to, to the store and get my iced tea. And I walk in, and I notice things are kind of blurry. And it was blurry because I have tears in my eyes, reminiscing and wondering, where did 40 years go? Where did that go? That went by awful fast. And, and a lot of times people look back and, and you know what they do? They, they wish they could live their life over and not make such a mess of it. But I look back and I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad that I lived my life for God. I'm thankful that I've lived my life for Jesus Christ. No regrets about that. I've never ever met a believer who's been faithful to God and served God and, and, and lived for God with all his heart and lived a godly life. Whoever looked back over his life and said, oh, I, I wish I hadn't have given my life to Christ. I wish I hadn't have spent my life living for God. I've never heard anybody say that. Oh, I've heard quite a few say, I wish I hadn't waited so long to get saved. I wish I would have got saved earlier. Some of you who got saved later in life, you'll hear testimonies of people who got saved when they were five and six and seven years old, and in your heart you'll say, boy, I wish that would have been me. Would have, would have changed my life around. Would have made my life different. And the reason people get to the end of their life and, and they say, hey, I've spent 40 years or 50 years or 60 years living for God and serving God and being faithful to Him and I don't regret a minute of it. Is because living for God and the life of godliness is the most fulfilling and the most satisfying and the most enjoyable life you'll ever live. There is no better life. Oh, listen, before, long before Jimmy Stewart ever made a movie and said it's a wonderful life, there are people in the Bible who live for God that said it's a wonderful life. Living for Jesus Christ. Godliness. There's, there's two passages of Scripture I want you to get. I want you to go to the Old Testament. Um, <coughs> uh, well, you're close to Timothy. Get 1 Timothy 4 if you're right there. And then, now I'm, I'm confusing myself here because I want to go to Samuel. And i got to look quick. It's 1 Samuel 26, I believe. 1 Samuel 26. Yeah, 1 Samuel 26. Here, David, it's the time when Saul has been chasing David around and really wanting to hunt him down and kill him. And David's dodging him. <laughs> and the opportunity arises for David to, to kill him. Saul and his men have slept and David has opportunity, but David doesn't do it, even though his men wanted him to. Saul realizes that David spared his life, and here's how he responds in verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will do no more harm. I will, do, I will no more do thee harm. Because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Three statements Saul makes. I have sinned. I have played the fool. I have, sin I have erred exceedingly. That's Saul. Now, if you look over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, here is the Apostle Paul. Similar name he used to be called Saul in Saul in 2nd Timothy chapter 4 
sorry, it should be 2 Timothy chapter 4. Most of you know 2 Timothy is the last book Paul wrote before he had his head cut off. So these are his last words. Notice the three statements Paul makes for his last words in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7. What does Paul say? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What a contrast. Both of those men, three statements. Saul, I have sinned. I have played the fool. I have erred exceedingly. Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Hey, at the end of your life, what three statements would you like to say? Which of those two would you like to be said? Godliness. And it depends on whether you live a life of godliness and obedience or whether you live a life of worldliness and rebellion against God. As to what you'll say when you come to the end of your life. Live for Jesus. Live for God. It's, it's the most beneficial life you could ever live. It's the greatest life in all the world. I, I, it was, we, we went on a, a five-day cruise and we're coming home and we're in the elevator and my wife, bless her heart, she talks to everybody. <laughs> who, who talks on an elevator? You know, it's a rule, isn't it? You're not allowed to talk in an elevator, isn't that right? <laughs> you ever notice that? People you talk, they get on the elevator, doors close, everybody just looks at the numbers. <laughs> not my wife. No. She gets on, the place is packed, you know. Well, is everyone ready to go back? <laughs> and the guy says, No. No, I'm not ready to go back home. And, and, and everybody in there, no. And, and you know what? I say, I am. I'm ready. You know why? I love what I do. I love living for God. I, I love going to the prison and preaching the Word of God and, and visiting people. And, and I love the Christian life. It's the greatest life in all the world. Take a little bit of that other stuff goes a long way. I'm ready to get back to what I love to do. Godliness penetrates every area of your life. Don't you're miserable if you try to just put your godliness to Sunday, and then then you live like you want the rest of the week. That's not Christianity. That's not what God has for you. Godliness. I gotta hurry. Number three. Godliness is produced through exercise. Did you notice what he said in 1 Timothy 4? He said, exercise thyself unto godliness. Verse 7. That's spiritual exercise. Now, I'm not an expert at exercise. However, underneath this outer exterior is a finely tuned athlete. <laughs> but I do know this. Number one, exercise is work. You know, there's, they'll tell you when you go to the gym and you want to work out or get in shape or lose weight, whatever it is, you know what? They're going to tell you there are no shortcuts. I mean, everybody wants a pill they can take and just... Everything's gone, I'll be buff and I'm in shape. And, you know, there is no pill. There's no easy way. We tell the folks when they come into RU, you, you know, yeah, it'd be nice. Somebody just sprinkle some dust on your head and, man, I don't have any more cravings. I uh, never want anything bad anymore. Everything's just great. It doesn't work that way. It takes effort. Exercise is work. There's no shortcut to being physically fit. And I'm going to tell you something. There's no shortcut to godliness. There's no easy route to godliness. 
You don't just lay your Bible under your pillow at night and go to sleep and wake up godly. It doesn't work that way. Michael Phelps didn't become the world's greatest swimmer by just hanging around the pool every day. Michael Jordan didn't become a great basketball player by sitting in the gym and watching people play. You don't get to be a, a great athlete or an outstanding professional athlete by sitting around on the couch eating Little Debbie's or Ho-Ho's and snacking on Doritos. Doesn't work that way. The truth is, no matter how naturally talented somebody is, as an athlete, if they don't work, if they don't put in the effort, they will not excel. They will not succeed. You have to work at it. I remember reading an article about uh, Mark Spitz back when he won seven gold medals. I think it was in Mexico City. And you know what he said? He said, I ate in the pool. I was in the, he was literally in the pool for eight to ten hours a day. They put food beside the pool and he'd eat it and then keep swimming. He literally gave himself these gymnasts that are involved, they, they go away. They're not even with their parents. They're up at 5 in the morning and they're in the gym. The dedication that they have to put in, the work that they have to put in to be the best. And we think hmm, that godliness will just happen when we put so little effort into it. If little effort does not give us any effect physically, little effort is not going to give you any effect spiritually. You've got to put forth some effort. You've got to be willing to put in some work. I told somebody recently, it takes discipline. Now listen, discipline doesn't make you godly. Discipline doesn't make you spiritual. Some of you men have been in the military and knew some very disciplined people. But they weren't godly. They weren't spiritual. But what discipline does is it makes spirituality, it makes godliness available to you. If I'm not disciplined enough to get up when the alarm goes off and, and, and get alone with God and to read His Word and to pray to Him and, and allow Him to, to, to develop that relationship with Him, if I'm not disciplined enough to get up, if I just lay in bed, I'm never going to be spiritual. If I'm not disciplined enough to say, I'm going to be in church when the doors are open so I can hear the teaching and the preaching of God's Word so I can be around the fellowship of other believers, I'm going to discipline myself to say, I'm going to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, I'm going to be faithful to church. That's just it. If you're not disciplined enough to do that, you'll never be godly. You'll miss it because you're not disciplined. The root word of disciple is discipline. Discipline one. See, it, it's work, but exercise always requires some discipline. Some routine. It's not just, is it just exercise that'll make you healthier and and make you stronger, and make you feel better? No. It's regular exercise. You can't say, oh man, I tried that exercise thing. I walked one day for 15 minutes three years ago. <laughs> it didn't do me any good. Well, you didn't do it any you got to do regular. You can't just do something one time. So he says, yeah, I tried it. I went to church. I went over there to church one time. It didn't, uh, not what I wanted. 
You went one time. You see how silly that is? That's like somebody saying, yeah, I went to the gym once and eh, I didn't lose any weight, so I'm not going back. <laughs> In fact, you know what happens? Those of you who, how many, anybody work out regularly? Brother Bowman, I know you do. Brother Yoder, I know he does. What happens, what happens if you don't? What happens if you miss, miss two weeks or miss a month? You come right back and start, pick up right where you left off? You don't, do you? Brother Yoder, if you're, if you're doing reps on your weights, at, uh, what do you, what do you, you do repetitions at, at what, what do you bench when you do repetitions? Oh, you can be humble, it's all right, that's all right. That's all right. It's different? What, what's a normal weight for you? Would 150 be too much? Would 200 be too much? Let's say, let's say it's 200, okay? Because he's, he's tough. If he's, he's a, uh, he can bench more than that, but I mean repetitions, all right? He's going to do 10 reps of 200, 250 pounds, and he's doing that. He does that regularly. And it gets to where that's not a big deal. He can do that. But then he gets sick, and he misses a week, and then he has to go away for a week on vacation. And it's, he comes back, and all of a sudden it's been about 20 days since he's lifted any weights. Does he sit right down and put 200 and 250 pounds on there and start doing it 10 times? No. You just start building back up to that again, don't you? Because if you don't keep working, you go backwards. If you don't keep steady in your Christian life, you go backwards. You don't, you don't ever, you think of it as, you think of the Christian life as an incline. That's what the songwriter said when he said, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. And you just think about your car going up an incline. And if you let off the gas, you just sit there. No, you begin to go backwards. You can never let off the gas in your Christian life. You have to, you have to keep pressing on. You have to keep that, that, that regular routine up. Those of you, how many of you, you've been faithful to church and, and you're being faithful to church now, but how many of you have been, you've been saved long enough that there was a period of time when you got out of church? Anybody honest enough to admit that? Okay. Let me ask you a question. Once you started missing, did it get easier to miss? It does. And, and then it's hard to come back. Now, once you get the routine going and you're used to going all the time, boy, it's weird to miss. And you say, man, this just doesn't feel right. So you don't want to you don't want to lose the routine. You don't want to lose that momentum that you get. Now, godliness. Let me say just a word or two about contentment. I know it's late. I'm going to get you out of here. The, the song service took a long time this morning. <laughs> All right. Contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment is a resting or a satisfaction of mind. A resting or a satisfaction of mind. You know what Paul said in chapter 6? He said, We brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 8, Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. What does he say we're supposed to be content with? Food and clothing. Content again, remember? He's saying we ought to have a resting or be satisfied in our mind that we have something to eat and something to wear. In America, we have a whole lot more than that. William Boyce wrote this. He said, Lord, I've been rereading the record of the rich young ruler and his obviously wrong choice. But it got me to thinking. No matter how much wealth he had, he couldn't ride in a car, have any surgery, 
turn on a light, buy penicillin, hear an organ or a piano, watch television, wash dishes in running water, look at a smartphone, or type on a computer, mow a lawn, fly in an airplane, sleep on an inner spring mattress, or even talk on a phone. If he was rich, what am I? Wow. If he's rich, <laughs> what are you and me? We're beyond rich. We talk about that contentment when, when they surveyed people whose incomes were $25,000 and below and they asked them what, what the American dream was. You know what they told them? $54,000 a year. But when they surveyed the people who made 50000 a year, their, their American dream was 100000 a year. And in every situation, when they surveyed those who were making 100000 a year, their American dream was 200000 a year. Always out there. Never, never happy or contented with what God's given me. Always want something more. In other words, the American dream is always about twice as much as what I have. And if all you do is compare yourself to what your neighbor has or what somebody down the street has or what I wish I had or which I see those people on TV have, listen, you will live an unhappy, miserable life. You'll never be content. You'll always want more. The Bible makes it clear we're to be content with what we have. You are never to be content with what you are. We're always desiring to be more like Christ. And none of us have arrived there yet. Anybody have anybody walk up to you this week and say, excuse me, you remind me of Jesus Christ? I'll wait a moment. I don't think so. So we got room to improve there. But we sure can be content with what we have. And stop coveting things we don't have. God has supplied what you need. Remember, godliness for the life that now is and for the life to come. And so we're content with what the Lord has given to us. Contentment in Christ is what we need. As I see God working in my life and molding me and making me to be like Jesus, that's what I want. That's what I'm after. And that's what I have to focus on. And as long as I have something to eat and God provides food and clothing, I'll be content. Why? I'm not taking any of it with me anyway. None of it goes with you. You carried nothing into the world and you're carrying nothing out. As the fellow said, there's no U-Hauls behind the hearse. Doesn't go. A resting, a peace, a satisfaction in my mind. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Let's pray, shall we? We've got to go. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for these thoughts that you gave the Apostle Paul to pen to Timothy that we have looked at this morning that have been a help to us. And Lord, I pray that you would help these two traits, these two characteristics to settle down into our hearts this morning. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Lord, I pray that we would focus and that there'd be many folks in the room this morning who would say, I am going to exercise myself. I will 
put in the effort, I will establish a routine of godliness. Exercising myself to godliness. For that has the promise of the life that now is and the life that is to come. And that is what I base my contentment on. Because Jesus is all I need. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. And so give us that contentment, that life of enjoyment, and that calmness and peace of mind, that restful spirit, that those who are caught up in the things of the world and caught up in always wanting more and always needing more and always desiring more will look at us and marvel at the contentment that we have. And we'll have opportunity to tell them that it's because of godliness. And we'll have opportunity to tell them of Jesus. Now, Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. I pray that each heart will be open to what the Spirit of God is telling them to do.